Looking good, looking good. Good to see everybody. What's up? Hi, hi, Brittany. Okay, so are, are we going to have to move Brittany over here to get... Okay, okay all right. Good. I'm so, so, so glad to see everybody. Okay, so this was probably... The sermon I'm about to tell you was probably about 2002. So it was, it was very early in... Um, my ministry, which I didn't know that's what it was. I was just going to places where people would say, come tell us about Jesus. And I was like, okay, I'll come. And so I got invited to speak at a youth camp um, in Florida. So the majority of my speaking for years was always to youth. So I went to a youth camp, but I did a physical uh, before the youth camp. And so, by the way, particularly if you're over 35, get a physical every single year. Everybody, can I get an amen? amen. No, seriously. Amen. amen. So anyway, I got a physical and my blood work came back and they were like, well, we need to check your um, kidneys because something seems to be off. One of the things as an NFL f- football player is you take a lot of pain pills because you're basically hurt the whole year. And uh, there's stories about problems with kidneys and those types of things. So make a long story short, I got a call from my doctor, and I'm in Florida. He's like, hey, we may need to do some tests because this may be this. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Then I had to go somewhere in the jungles of Florida to where this camp was, and there was no phone service. And so I'm thinking, like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? How much time do I have left? And no, seriously, no, I, I really didn't know. And so... I couldn't call Vicky, and so I just grabbed the Bible, and I curled up, and I just cried myself to sleep, but it was one of those moments that I knew that the Word of God was true, that even if I didn't have long, I would have a long eternity with a resurrection body. Also, it really hit me to get serious about life and serious about the gospel, If the word of God is not true, then it's hard to walk by faith in the one that the word of God is about. And so often in a crisis, we will be pushed to deeper realities of Christ, but the way we know Christ is through the Bible. And so we want to enhance our trust of the reliability of the Bible. So this theology night is what is the Bible and how can we trust the Bible? What is the Bible and how can we trust the Bible? So if you grew up in church, which Vicky and I didn't, but if you grew up in church, maybe you think that one day um, the Bible just fell out of heaven written in King James English. You know, No, there's a whole beautiful, incredible story, and so we're going to try to do our best to walk through it, and I'm going to give you some resources for further study. So let's dive into it, all right? So um, the Bible is actually a library of 66 books. It's a library of 66 books. We got 39 in the Old Testament, which I don't particularly like the word Old Testament, but since it's so often used, what I prefer is First Testament. So the Bible is a library of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, okay? So it's a, it's a library of all these books that make one book. The Bible was written by 40 different authors from various backgrounds over 1,500 years on three continents, So, Asia. Now, when we say Asia, don't think in terms of modern terms. So, Asia in the ancient days would have been like Turkey. Um, You have um, Africa. Uh, Particularly, we as Americans or Christians in the West, particularly in America, we don't understand the depth and the influence of Africa on historic Christianity, and it's to our detriment. And then you have Europe. And in three languages, um, ancient Hebrew, Greek, the, the Bible that, that Jesus and the apostles would, apostles would have written is what's called the Sept, 
Septuagint. Everybody say Septuagint with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew translation of the Old Testament. Why did they translate it into Greek? Because of the influence of the Roman Empire and Greece and all that stuff, Koine Greek was the common language of the people. So um, I can travel to many parts of the world and they speak English because English has become like a common language for multiple uh, people's groups in various places. And then you have Aramaic. So Jesus most likely spoke Aramaic. So when he prayed, our father, it was Abba. It's an Aramaic term for father, daddy, all right? So the Bible is written by 40 different authors from various backgrounds over 1,500 years on three continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, and in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Now, the claims of the Bible, the Bible claims to be the word of God. The Bible claims to be the word of God. So uh, my mentor, and God is so gracious, um, literally Dr. Norman Geisler wrote the standard textbook in the, 60, uh, in the 70s on the authority of the Bible. And he was my mentor for over 10 years plus. It's unbelievable when I look back. I mean, that's like having Michael Jordan as your basketball coach. It's crazy. So the Bible claims to be and proves to be the word of God. It was written by prophets of God under the inspiration of God. And so some of the terms that um, are used in academic settings are like the Bible is inerrant, means it doesn't have any errors. It means um, the Bible is infallible. The Bible is indiscrutable. Um, let me put it to you in this language. We can trust the Bible. It is reliable. It is the heart of God communicated through his prophets for us to have the word of God. Dr. Geisler writes, the Bible cannot err since it is God's word and God cannot err. Now, let me pause here. We as human beings, however, can and do error. Can I get an amen? amen? So one of the things that you learn, the more you learn, the more you don't know, and it keeps you humble to learn. The less you know, the more you think you know because you have not been exposed to more bodies of knowledge and information. So... The only person who ever had, or persons who ever had perfect theology, obviously was Jesus and his prophets and apostles that he had right, but the rest of us were trying to figure it out as we go along. So typically, if someone comes to you like, man, I discovered something new, and it's like, wait a second, hold up, wait, wait, the church has been around 2,000 years and you figured it out? That's called a cult. That's how cults get started. That's how false religions get started. There are sometimes I'll be like, man, boy, I'm saying something good. And I'll be like, man, Augustine said this 1,700 years ago. He ain't saying, he ain't saying nothing new. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, St. Augustine was a North African preacher uh, 1,700 years ago. He's one of the greatest theologians in church history. So also when it says, uh, can you go, go back? Also when it says the Bible cannot err since it is God's word, and God cannot err it, that does not mean there aren't difficult passages and things in the Bible. If you and I could understand everything in the Bible at all times, we would not need faith. I personally believe Jonah fell off the boat and some big fish ate him. I believe God can do miracles. Now, personally, I don't want to be fishing and fall over and get eaten by a fish to find out if it's true or not, okay? Um, there are difficult passages, but we are a people who believe in the miraculous. This is something that Dr. Geisler used to say. If God can bring the universe out of existence from nothing, then being in the belly of a whale is pretty easy. So we presuppose that there is a miraculous God who does miraculous and incredible things. So the, God, so the Bible not having errors does not mean that we as human beings don't err, and it does not mean that there are some passages that are difficult 
and hard to understand. All right? So let me bathe this in this word here. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14 through 16. Now let me pause here. Who is Timothy? If you grew up in the church, everybody thinks Timothy was a youth pastor. No, Timothy was the pastor of the churches in Ephesus. He was a full-grown human being. And so when Paul tells him, let no one despise you because of your youth, it was because he was new. And where was Timothy pastoring? Timothy was pastoring in modern-day Turkey or Ephesus. What was happening in Ephesus and Turkey? You had Jewish people from different backgrounds, and you had Gentile people from different backgrounds. And those people who were Gentiles came from worshiping all types of idols, different types of sexual ethics. Um, And so Timothy had a hard, hard job. Also, here's something else. This is really important. If you are going into an area where there's Jews and Gentiles, do you think it would help if the pastor was biracial? His dad was a Gentile and his mom was a Jew. So he could understand those worlds. Isn't it sad that we've typically missed that in preaching for all these years? Doesn't it add so much color to go... Paul's like, I got the guy who can go to Ephesus. They're like, what Jew is he? He's like, no, no, he's a Gentile. A Gentile? And by the way, he's a Jew also. And so he could reach those different types of people. So look at the beauty of this, teenagers, the beauty of what Paul says here in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 16 to encourage him. But as for you, continue and what you have learned and firmly believed. So listen, for all of us, not just the teenagers, for all of us, we are all going to get hit with challenges and all types of things that are gonna make us shake at our knees. And by faith, we hold firm. Listen to the pastoral words of Paul. He says, you know those who taught you. And you know that from infancy, you have known the sacred scriptures. So from infancy, he's known the sacred scriptures. And what he's talking about is the Old Testament, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Wisdom is the skill to live life. And like we teach here at Transformation Church, salvation biblically is not just escaping hell when we die. Salvation is being brought into God's kingdom. We are forgiven. We're born again. We're declared righteous. We become brothers and sisters. We become temples of the Holy Spirit. Right here, right now, we become conduits of the love of Christ. Please tell your friends who go to other churches that. Please tell them that. One of the reasons why we as the church in America don't have much power is we have a reductionistic gospel. That's a big word. Reductionistic means means this. Okay, Jesus forgave me. I don't go to hell. So what do you do with the rest of your life? No, like he literally comes to live in us and, and through us and he graces us and transforms us. All scripture is inspired by God. God breathe. So when Paul was writing, he wasn't like, uh, uh, I don't know what I wrote. You know, God takes regular people in regular situations, in regular circumstances, and he writes. So Paul's letters, they're called the epistles. Paul's letters were written to different churches for different situations and different circumstances. Like, Paul, okay, some of y'all might get mad, but I love you. Paul doesn't go, this is how you should vote. Paul lived in the Roman Empire, y'all. There was no voting. (laughs) You didn't vote. You got put on a cross if you got out of the problems with Rome. So we have to have common sense and wisdom and grace. And it's profitable for teaching We don't like this one for rebuking. By the way, doesn't that word just sound just, I rebuke you. 
<laughs> By the way, rebuke just seems like, hey, that, that's not in alignment with God's grace. That's not in alignment with God's will. For correcting, we all need to be corrected. I love this, for training in righteousness. This, this word here, righteousness, in the Greek language, has many meanings, but it, it, it actually means justice. Justice is training in making wrongs right. And how do you make wrongs right? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that the man or woman, this word anthropos can mean man or woman, so that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We believe that as the scripture says that we are co-laborers and partners with Jesus. What did God tell Adam and Eve in the garden? Be fruitful, multiply, and I want you to work the garden. That is symbolic and a metaphor for you're working with me to bring heaven to earth, and that's still true. Your job, teenagers, your schoolwork, everything that we do is a playground for Jesus to create beauty. All of life is what? Let's say it like we mean it. All of life is? All right, very good. I had to throw a little devotional in there. Okay, here we go. Jesus believed the Bible is the word of God. We have multiple scriptures that we could do, and the New Testament is simply the Old Testament being requoted and reworked around Jesus. This is when Jesus was being tempted by Satan. He answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but, by, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. My prayer and my hope for us here at Transformation Church that when people ask us questions, Scripture is just flowing out of us. That Scripture is flowing out of us. Now, God has blessed me with a freaky memory. Like, I remember being a baby, getting milk out of, um, what, do you, what do you call it? No, no, not, not the carton. It was a plastic bag with milk and a plastic thing around it. I remember seeing that. Like, I've, I have a memory. So I can remember Scripture. You don't have to do that. You don't have to know Scripture the way I know Scripture. You don't have to memorize it, okay? So don't feel that pr pressure because some, sometimes like, man, I don't know Scripture like that. Well, that's not for you. Be the best that you can be. The main thing is that, that we can communicate it, and, and, and it's a part of us, that it's in our souls. By the way, Jesus is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy here. All right, so I want to give you briefly, and by the way, this is a three-hour lecture that I'm doing in 25 minutes. Um, you can trust the Bible, and I want to give you an acronym called MAP. I got this from a guy named Hank Hanegraaff. It's called MAP. It stands for Manuscripts, Archaeology, and Prophecy, okay? Okay, so let's look at manuscript evidence. If you go to the barbershop, like I used to go, I cut my own hair now, but when I used to go to the barbershop, People will go, man, I don't believe the Bible. King James wrote the Bible. And, you know, I have to be respectful. I, I can't go, do you know how ignorant you sound right now? No, King James did not write the Bible. There's a King James translation, but King James didn't do it. There's multiple manuscripts in multiple languages. So I want to give you some manuscript evidence, and let's start with the Old Testament, right? How do we know that the Old Testament has been copied accurately throughout history? Because one of the things that you're going to get on TikTok is, well, how do we know the Bible's been copied accurately? Well, we know because we have a lot of manuscripts. By the way, that sounds so good to hear that paper turning. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, I've actually been to this site in the Qumran Caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran began, beginning in 1949 had a significant apologetic implications. Apologetic comes from the Greek word apologia. It's a word that attorneys would use in the first century, and it means to give a defense or to give reasons. These ancient texts hidden in pots and clifftop caves by a monastic religious community called the Essenes confirmed the reliability of the Old Testament text. 
They provide significant portions of the Old Testament books, even entire books that were copied and studied by the Essenes. These manuscripts date as early as the third century BC. So we actually have manuscript evidence that the Old Testament was preserved and copied throughout history. All right, let's skedaddle over to the New Testament. There's a ton more information, but I just want to give us the highlights. This is like a movie trailer. So let's go over to the New Testament. Now, how do we know the New Testament has been copied accurately as well? So I want to give you this chart here, right? So if you study history, um, which you will, and let me say this too. This is really important. Uh, I'm going to target uh, the, the teenagers and preteens first. God wants to use your minds, okay? Okay. To be a Christian does not mean you're not smart. I don't know where that com comes from. Some of the smartest people to ever walk the face of the earth have followed Jesus. So when you're studying in school, when you go to college, when you do those things, that's an act of worship. And knowing history is so, so important. One of the blessings of being able to reach people is being able to meet them where they are. And how do you do that? You read widely. You understand deeply. You listen well. What does the Bible say? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? So we don't want to just be all heart and no mind, and we don't want to be all mind and no heart. We want to be holistic, but it's according to your giftedness. Everybody understand that? So, for example, the manuscripts of Plato, right? Plato was one of the world's greatest philosopher. He was a student of Socrates. And so what writings do we have a number of his copies? Now, high schools and colleges all over the world study this man, and there are seven copies left of his original work, of manuscripts, seven. And very rarely, if ever, do you hear anybody going, well, you can't trust that. We don't have enough evidence. Um, Aristotle, big Aristotle. I'm an Aristotle guy more than Plato guy because he influenced one of my guys, Thomas Aquinas, but nevertheless. Anyway, so, so 1,500 years lapsed and we got 49 copies. For time's sake, let's go to the New Testament. So date written between 40 and 95 AD, earliest copy, 125 AD, years lapsed, 30 years, number of manuscripts, 24,000. There is no ancient book in the world that has more manuscript support than the New Testament. Now, does that mean perfect interpretation? No. Does that mean there's not difficult questions? No. But what it does mean is someone cannot academically and credibly say, well, we can't trust the New Testament because it wasn't copied correctly or accurately or preserved. That's just flat out a falsity. Now... Are there discrepancies in the manuscript? Yes, there are. But the manuscript discrepancies have no effect on any form of doctrine or belief. Let me give you an example of what some of those errors they're called would be. In one manuscript, say that you found in Ephesus, it would say, you know, God is just and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Another one would say God is and misspelled just and justifier. So, so they're more like the slip of a, of a pen versus any type of true error. Now, why is this important? If there was only one manuscript with no mistakes in it, what could happen? If there was just one, it could be manipulated. It could be destroyed. It could be burned. It could be turned into all types of things. So it's actually good that there's an abundance of manuscripts. Also, in addition to the Greek manuscripts, there are numerous translations from the Greek, not to mention quotations of the New Testament, counting major early translations in Syriac, Coptic, Arabic, Latin, and other lang languages. There are 9,000 copies of the New Testament. This makes a total of over 14,000 copies of the New Testament. What is more, if we compile the 36,289 quotations by the early church fathers of the 2nd to 4th centuries, we can restruct the entire New Testament minus 11 verses. That's dope. 
Man, when I first learned that in class, I was like, give me a high five, doc. Hey, but why is this important, though? When the pressures of life come and the challenges, and if you don't trust that this is the word of God, it's easy to fall away. All right, let's look at archaeology. We don't have a lot to get into, uh, but I have been to the Middle East. I should have brought some pictures, but I have been to um, Ephesus. I've been to Greece. I've been to Israel. I've seen the places. It's pretty epic. As a matter of fact, however, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. For time's sake, I'm not going to be able to show you any. However, I have given you tons of resources that you'll be able to look them up on your own. And there's a great thing. Teenagers, check this out. Um... Back in the day, when I finally figured out where the library was, because my girlfriend, whom now is my wife, took me, we would have to do research. And we couldn't, we, we, we couldn't say, hey, Google. We couldn't do chat GBT. We had to do this thing called microfish. These little old bitty things that you put under a microscope to look them up. Dude, it took forever. For your, can I get an amen from anybody remembering them days? You guys don't know how good y'all got it. You can be like, hey, Google. So you've got, you have an incredible resource at your fingertips. Also, though, just as there's an incredible resource, the devil is busy. Um, I'm not even on TikTok anymore. But there were some reels that would come by, and I'm like, man, if you're like 16, you'd actually believe this guy. And so that's why we want to equip you because the devil is busy, but that, not just for t- teenagers, but for all of us, all right? In the extraordinary ways, modern archaeology has affirmed the historical core of the Old and New Testaments, corroborating key portions of the story of Israel's patriarchs, the Exodus the Davidic monarchy, and the life and times of Jesus. So this is from the U.S. News and World Report, 1999. So that's old. And then lastly is prophecy evidence, manuscript, archaeology, prophecy. Professor Emeritus of Science at Westmont College, Peter Stoner, has calculated the probability of one man, this is Jesus, fulfilling the major prophecies made concerning the Messiah The estimates were worked out by 12 different classes representing some 600 university students. So the odds of Jesus not fulfilling 60, but 8 out of 60, meaning uh, a prophecy that um, Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That's where the Messiah would be. Jesus was born there. He fulfilled numerous, more than 60, but let's just take 8 out of 60 the odds of that happening are one in 10 with 17 zeros behind it. 48 out of 60, not 60 out of 60, but 48. The odds of that happening is one in 10 with 157 zeros behind it. Now, is that 100% proof? No, but it sure is close. God is never going to give us 100% proof because we would need no faith. So here come some terms. Our faith is reasonable. God gives us good reasons to believe. It's not rationalistic. Rationalism says if I can't taste it, touch it, see it, or feel it, it must not be real. Well, there's a lot of things that we can't touch or see, like our thoughts, our mind. Already? Now what? Get into the Word of God so the Spirit of God can transform you into the image of the Son of God for the glory of God. So uh, we're going to talk about this more next week. 
like how do we actually study the Bible, but the one thing that I want to say is make it a holy habit of marinating and soaking yourself in Scripture. Um, you don't want to read it like you're reading a textbook. It is a love letter from a good, good father who wants us to know his son. Next week, we're going to show how all of Scripture testifies and points to Jesus. Have you ever met somebody that's incredibly wicked but knows the Bible really good? I have. Just because a person knows the Bible really good doesn't mean they know Jesus really good. Demons know the Bible way better than us. They just don't believe it. So the goal of reading the Bible is not to simply have biblical truth. It's to grow a tender, loving, upward, inward, outward heart because the Scripture reveals King Jesus. It's about worship. It's not about winning a Bible competition. It's not about arguing. It's about being steadfast and anchored in the deep, deep love of God. Well, I didn't go over too bad. All right. So we're going to talk more about this part next week. Get an easy-to-read Bible translation. Um, you probably have family or friends who are like, brother, if it ain't King James, I don't even know if you saved. Just, just say, God bless you, and just move on. There's no need to argue. No, there are some groups. In the early years of Transformation Church, we had people leave because I didn't use King James. We're like, so find a translation. Uh, Bible commentary, the one that I use 95% of the time is called R.J. Utley. It's a free Bible commentary online. R.J. Utley, free Bible commentary. So next week, we're going to learn how to do observation. What does the passage say? We're going to learn about interpretation. What does the passage mean? Step three, we're going to learn about application. What will I do about what the passage says and means? And then I put some resources there in your notes.